Good afternoon. I'm Zanny Minton Beddoes from The Economist, and I am delighted to welcome you to this uh, conversation about the work of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which is, uh, I have to say, one of the more extraordinary initiatives to come out of Davos recently. Uh, it is easy for many of us to become cynical about what the World Economic Forum can achieve, particularly in this era of, of populist anger. But this, for me, has been a very powerful example of the concrete achievements that this meeting can have. It was born out of a conversation a year ago by all of my fellow panelists here and many others who are in the audience. It's a concrete initiative between governments, foundations, and the private sector, governments of Norway, Germany, Japan, and India, two of the biggest foundations in the world, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust Foundation, strong support from the world's six biggest pharmaceutical companies, GSK, Merck, Johnson & Johnson, Sanofi, Takeda, and Pfizer, I'm saying this not to, to make an advertisement for all the individual ones, but to say this really is an initiative that has come together. And they were just telling me before we came on stage, there was a meeting, one hour meeting last year, between about, I think you said 24 people, saying something has to be done. We know, we've learned from SARS, but most recently from Ebola, the extraordinary danger that, that epidemics pose. We know that they are one of the greatest threats we have. We also know that vaccines can protect against those threats, but we know that there is a challenge getting vaccines into a state of preparedness that they can be used quickly and effectively. There is what we economists call somewhat of a market failure there. And so the public and private sector came together, and over the past year they went from talking to actually doing. This initiative now has contributions, concrete contributions of $460 million, and I hear from Bill Gates, who I'm sure knows better than anyone, that we have promises of 700 million. So this has been a pretty big achievement. And we're gonna spend the next hour talking about what this initiative, CEPI initiative is going to do and how it will quite frankly change and one of the most important threats we face. So with that introduction, I will quickly introduce the panel. You know all of them, but to my immediate left, going left to right for you, the Prime Minister um, of Norway, Prime Minister Erna Solberg, Next to her, Jeremy Farrar, the director of the Wellcome Trust. Next to him, His Excellency Alpha Conde, the president of Guinea. Next to him, uh, Bill Gates, the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And last but not least, Andrew Whitty, chief executive of GlaxoSmithKline. So that is uh, six of the um, members, or rather five, I'm counting myself, <laughs> six of the members of the panel uh, and of this coalition. But before we get into the details of the discussion, let's tell you the story of CEPI in a two-minute video. This one started with a bat, a tree, and a boy called Emil, a life full of wonder, and a world to be explored. Soon after, he fell sick, and his family did too. Disease spread further still. Uncertainty led to fear. Epidemics affect us all. They affect anyone. At any time. They don't care about borders. Or nations. They are one of our greatest threats. And with our dense cities. Easy travel. And ecological change. They spread faster. And further. Than ever before. Businesses close. And airports shut. Billions are spent. And loved ones lost. The sound of a cough <laughs> becomes the worst sound of all. We've sent people into space, created incredible structures, and connected the world in ways we never dreamed. But we're yet to outsmart epidemics. We're always a step behind. Because we don't plan, we react. We know vaccines can protect us, we just need to be better prepared. So let's come together. Let's research and invest. Let's save lives. Let's, let's outsmart, outsmart epidemics. So, Prime Minister, so has my microphone gone? Now you can hear me. Prime Minister, let's start with you. 
we're always a step behind, the video says. We need a plan. Uh, you had that conversation a year ago. You needed a plan. Tell us why Norway is supporting it and what the plan is. Well, first of all, it's because uh, SEPA is growing out of uh, the lessons learned, uh, both from what was uh, good about our uh, response to the Ebola crisis, but also what went wrong. Why we didn't respond. If we'd have had it earlier, um, it would have been effective and it would have certainly stop the spread of Ebola, protecting the population. So it would have been extremely important. It would have had a huge effect. Um, we want to see a vaccination that is 100% reliable and 100% financed so that we really can take care of people. And I'm not just talking about Ebola here, I'm talking about other uh, hemorrhagic fever uh, diseases. So thank you very much for asking me that question. Bill Gates, there you have it. It would have been there within weeks. Um, you are uh, known as someone who likes concrete numbers and metrics of, of, of success. So I'd like to get your sense of First of all, why did you support this? But secondly, what do you expect and hope that CEPI will achieve? Well, unfortunately, even though there's a substantial risk of various types of epidemics, there's not a natural marketplace, and there's not a natural incentive for people to build products that anticipate that. Uh, it simply wouldn't make sense for the private sector on its own uh, to do this work. And so when we look at this kind of risk, the epidemic risk, you've got to bring governments and foundations together to create the right incentive structure. Uh, so the good news is that the uh, ability to make vaccines quickly, it may be possible to get that to be dramatically less than it's been. There's a new approach uh, that is sometimes called DNA RNA vaccines uh, that the part you would change to go after a new disease would be a very small part of it. And so a lot of the work, the safety work, the manufacturing work, you could cut that out. It would be uh, even easier than for flu vaccine today doing this uh, seasonal adaptation that is done on a yearly basis. And so the good news is that if you can get, if you can either predict uh, what the pathogen uh, is going to be and get that stockpiled, that's the ideal. Then you have a very, very quick response. The second best case is if you didn't anticipate the pathogen, then you get uh, using the private sector capability that uh, these CEPI funded projects will have helped advance. You'll very quickly go in and say, okay, make a vaccine. We don't know how quickly that can be done, but if we can get it down to a year, that would be very good. Now every week uh, counts. We have simulation showing that uh, if you can get out in six weeks, then even a flu epidemic, which is a very fast spreading epidemic, you can have a, a, a dramatic benefit to. That's not to say we know that we can get down to that kind of uh, a shorter time frame. Flu is one actually we should invest because we know it's there. We should invest and in uh, I'm sure it'll get done by various actors in a, in a universal vaccine for that. So uh, CEPI is very exciting. Uh, you know, it's enough to probably do several of these vaccines and really engage the, the private sector in a, in a concrete way before the next emergency hits. Nobody really knew uh, which approach should be taken, which diagnostic should be done. There are things that CEPI does not cover. It doesn't cover uh, antiviral drugs or diagnostics. And so there should uh, be follow-on efforts for those things, nor does it cover some of the governance questions like uh, how do you allocate vaccines uh, during a crisis like this. So there are still really important ongoing discussions uh, on those issues, but I really want to thank the partners who come in just in the discussions of the last year, everyone's taken a leap of faith to pull this together. Uh, and even in the next year, you know, we'll have the staff and I think we'll actually uh, uh, bid out a couple of these projects. So this is a, a substantial step uh, that deals with a, a problem that can keep you up at night if you think enough about it, which is the world's not really ready 
uh, for a lot of these epidemics, and Ebola was awful, it could have been even worse. There was even an element of luck that it didn't get into Nigeria in a big way. Uh, there was an element of luck that, uh, you know, it, it stopped where it did, and, and it raised so many questions that we need to be better prepared for next time. I want to come back uh, in a second and ask you about how big that ambition is of how far you're going to go. But first, uh, I wanted to bring Andrew in and get your sense from the pharmaceutical industry perspective of what is it that is missing? What is it that you need most that CEPI can help bring to, to push this forward? I think what CEPI does for all of the vaccine companies and the six of the companies who joined in to CEPI, I think all feel very much the same way planning, prioritization, and a mechanism to essentially create increased capacity in the space of research into these rare, unusual, but potentially deadly uh, uh, pathogenic threats. So if you think about what happens in, a, in, in, a, in a, an epidemic or a pandemic situation, first of all, there's almost no spare capacity in the global vaccine industry. If you walk around any of our vaccine plants, they are running full on, all the lines are busy because the world is growing, there is more and more need for vaccine. So the red phone rings and it's the WHO saying there's a crisis and we need an Ebola vaccine. Immediately after the WHO rings, a couple of countries start ringing to say, we want this vaccine now. That's an almost impossible situation for a company to try and to react to. So, and it's so disorganized because actually the world doesn't know if there's a vaccine candidate ready. They don't know whether there's any capacity lined up ready to go. The companies aren't anticipating that phone call. And what CEPI starts to do is to take the kind of things where we've had to react in the middle of the battle of the epidemic and take those things back to peacetime so that we can start to resolve these issues, start to say, yes, we're not perfect. We haven't got perfect foresight, but we can more or less estimate that from these 12 potential pathogens, there's a reasonable chance one of them could be the next pandemic. So let's start working on them. It doesn't mean we're going to get everything right, but let's at least start working. How do we start to think about taking vaccine candidates through to the end of phase two so that when a pandemic starts, instead of discussing and debating how to do a phase two trial, we go straight to phase three. Those are the sorts of progress points we can make. Why is that sensible for us? Because at the end of the day, when it really boils down to it, the only people who are going to make a vaccine for the world are the six vaccine manufacturers. And so it's in our interest to make this situation much less stressful, much easier for us to react to without disrupting all of the other day-to-day -day vaccine manufacturers. Because we were very close, I think, in the three companies who were most advanced in Ebola. If it had indeed got worse, we would have all been put in the very difficult position of saying, do we make Ebola vaccine at scale or do we make rotavirus vaccine or another vaccine? And then the world is making a completely invidious choice, which could have been avoided. And that's why we're so supportive of CEPI. And I think all six companies who are represented here today have worked very, very well to help bring this to fruition. So, so CEPI will mean that for a certain number of pathogens, there will be vaccines at the beginning of stage two trials. Now, I guess then for me, the question is, you know, money is not limitless. Um, what is the, and you, you mentioned this was, this was in some sense self-interest insurance, you're buying insurance. What is the right level of insurance to buy? How much, how many vaccines should you, how many pathogens should you go after? And how, what should the scale of this be? You're clearly just starting. This is a very big start, but how do you think of that? And Bill Gates, I'm looking at you because I know that you, you, you think in these terms. So what, you know, what's the ambition in terms of what's the right number to go after or the right scale of this? Um, the, the number of potential pathogens out there is, is far greater than we're likely to do specific constructs for. So, you know, maybe if we're lucky, we can cover the things that are 50% or 60% of the risk. Flu is kind of a special one that we should just go, go and do. But even putting that aside, uh, uh, there'll be some predictability and the, even the surprising ones will have some may have some relationship so that the, you're able to just change the vaccine modestly, particularly with these, these new platforms. 
you know, I, ideally I think we do five or six. Uh, at our current funding level, it's more likely uh, that we'll be able to do two or three. But there are some major actors uh, who will participate in this space, including the UK and the US and China, who whether they come into CEPI formally or they simply take their programs and make sure that they're comp complementary, like the US BARDA investments, the, uh, this endeavor will be bigger than the, the CEPI organization itself. And I'd say broadly, maybe we will get the 10 or so that uh, I think would be attractive. Once we get the 10, then I think the global health community should, should have a great debate about should we do 11 and or 12, you know, did it go as quickly as we want? At least we will have exercised the, you know, how do you go to the regulator and what do you do about stockpiles? Things, you wouldn't believe every question that should have been resolved in advance of the Ebola epidemic was not resolved in advance. In fact, we can still sort of debate some of these things about trial design that uh, uh, the, the CEPI construct will force the dialogue to continue and even to, to, to be more prepared. Prime Minister Solberg. Well, I think I'd just uh, follow up on the last part there because besides actually working on concrete vaccines, it's also important to have that discussion on how how do we have preparedness for scaling up? How do we have uh, a priority on how we do it? We can, you can do all those discussions that can take lengthy time when, when the problem arises. You can do it in forefront. You can have a scheme. You can have a, an international discussion on the priority. Everybody here. My main worry is that the world will still fall short of taking care of, of epidemic response. Prime Minister Solberg, how do you... Uh Leave and that is to maintain in progress. This is for malaria. Then success will demand future success. And conflicts are uh, the human suffering, as we saw, is immensely, and um, it should be therefore absolutely not just the countries that are standing behind it now. Except it now, it should be more countries, uh, more organisations more focus in the future on the older sides of how epidemic awareness should be better. Thank you. The stakes are enormously high, but this is a very big step forward. With that, our conversation, I'm afraid, has to come to an end, but I would like to call onto the stage uh, all of the other founding members of CEPI. There were more than the five uh, panelists here for a, if you will, a team photo to mark this occasion. So if you would uh, thank our panelists for the conversation and those of you come up, thank you. Once we get the 10, then I think the global health community should, should have a great debate about should we do 11 and or 12, you know, did it go as quickly as we want. At least we will have exercised the, you know, how do you go to the regulator and what do you do about thought health? You wouldn't believe every question that should have been resolved in advance of the Ebola epidemic was not resolved in advance. In fact, we can still some debates and these things try to design that uh, they, The Dr. construct will force the dialogue to continue and even to, to, to be more prepared.